Our first case is an investigation which began in September. The summer's hot weather had reduced the level of a reservoir at Rippenden in West Yorkshire. And someone noticed what looked like a body in the shallow water. As a result, what had for nearly a year been a missing persons inquiry became a full-scale murder investigation. The victim was 23-year-old Lawrence Wynne Stanley from Oldham, near Manchester. Lawrence was a car fanatic. He was a dedicated motor mechanic and worked all hours running his own workshop from a converted pigsty in Shover on the outskirts of Manchester. Please. He'd been working on Sunday, October the 2nd, but about a quarter to two, he dropped into the local pub, the Windsor, in Shaw Road in Royton. He was a regular there, although it was unusual for him to be there at lunchtime. Hello, Just a moment, please. Lawrence, phone. Right, come in. I'm just going to go around to my mother's house, lads. Uh, I'll be back in a minute, all right? I are you? Witnesses remember that Lawrence seemed agitated after taking that phone call. Lawrence's mother lives five minutes' drive away from the Windsor pub, but he didn't arrive there until after three o'clock, more than an hour later. Where had he been in the meantime? Ever since Lawrence had left home, he'd visited his mother regularly, sometimes two or three times a day. Hello, Hello Mum. Do you want to come with coffee? No, thanks. I'm in a bit of a rush. I've got a lot on today. I Are just you wanted sure? to see you're all set to go to Windermere. Oh, yes. Uh, listen, I've, to, I've brought you this to spend. Yeah, I'll take that. Oh, are you sure? Thank of you. I'm sure. I've got 240 quid here. Oh, you shouldn't show people money like that. No, it's all right. Are you all right? You yeah. look a bit worried. Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. Mm. Listen, what time is it? It's half past three. Oh, listen, I'll have to go. I'm in a real rush. I'm right. sorry, Mum. Bye, Mum. Bye, love. Listen, have a great time. Oh, all right. See you when you get back. Right. Bye. Later that Sunday evening, Lawrence was back in the Windsor. So listen, when can you come and fill that pit in for us up at the garage? Oh, I'll come and have a look tomorrow, eh? I mean, I've got that spade of yours in the case. I can look at it now if you like. No, don't bother. We've got plenty at work. So how much material do you think you'll need to fill in the pit? Oh, don't know. Like I said, I'll come and have a look at it tomorrow. Eh? I can start tomorrow if you like. Oh, that's great, yeah. All right, I'll see you later. All right. Okay, see you, Lawrence. Nobody actually saw Lawrence leave the pub that night, so the builder is the last known person to have seen him alive. That night, Lawrence Wynne Stanley disappeared. Nearly a year later, the hot weather during this last summer caused the water in Baiting's Dam at Rippenden in West Yorkshire to drop. Someone saw something that looked like a body and called the police. What we got to, there's certainly a body down there, sir. I can't tell at the moment whether it's male or female. Uh, it appears to be wrapped in some sort of material and it's weighted down. Let's feel it. We'll go to Halifax and set this here. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We've now established that the body we recovered from Baiting Reservoir on the 26th of September of this year is that of Lawrence Conran with Stanley. He was a motor dealer, and at the time when he went missing, it was believed that it was a simple missing from home. The inquiries that were carried out at that time could establish no reason why he should go missing. Two days after Lawrence had disappeared, his car was taken to a scrapyard. Just turn around, lads. Yeah. Just put it over there, will you? 
Lawrence had recently paid £350 for that car, planning to do it up and sell it for about £800, so he wouldn't have let it go for scrap. Three weeks later, a workman at the scrapyard recognised the car from a report he'd seen in the local newspaper and reported it to the police. A few weeks after that, after officers working on the missing persons inquiry had checked it over, the car was scrapped. Well, this had been a particularly violent murder. Mr Wilkinson, have you discovered a motive at all for it? After 16 weeks of inquiries, we've been unable to establish why anybody should want to kill Lawrence Wynne Stanley. It would appear from our inquiries that he had a life separate from that known to his family and friends. And it is this part of his life that is a mystery to us in the inquiry. And we feel that anybody who knew him in that part of his life or might hold the, the answer to this murder. And we appeal for those people to come forward. Anybody who I haven't spoken to at present who know him. How do you know he had a secret life? Was it to do with cars or...? It could well do to be do with his cars or his social life. The actual contents of that life we don't know, but it, we feel that it is an important part of our inquiry. No clues then on the phone caller in the pub? Again, we've been unable to trace the person who made that phone call, but it is of such significance to the inquiry because it caused Lawrence to be worried. It caused him to leave the public house that day and tell people he was going to his mother's, but he didn't go there for another hour. We want to trace that caller. We want them to come forward. We think they know what caused him to be worried that day. Lawrence disappeared on the 2nd of October, a Sunday, and so did his car, not to reappear again until the 4th of October. Where do you think that was during that time? We're trying to trace the movements of that car. It must have either been garaged or parked up somewhere between those two takes. It is essential for us that we find out where the car was. It could be that when it was taken in at 7.35 on that Tuesday morning, that it was in fact taken in by somebody, not connected with the murder, but on behalf of somebody else. And we're appealing for that person. They might not want to come forward because of the horrific nature of this murder. A man's been shot and burnt, and he might be frightened for his own safety. We want that person to come forward to assist us. He gave the name Burroughs, which might be significant. This is one of the three men at the scrapyard that day. That is This pickaxe head that you've brought in here and sash cord like this had been used to weight down and tie Lawrence's body in the reservoir. That's correct. What clues do these provide? The pickaxe head is, uh, was new. It was, would appear to have been purchased or stolen for the purpose of weighing the body down. It's of South American origin and it's distributed by one person in the UK, Chilton Manufacturing Limited at Eccles. The sash cords uh, are manufactured at Bolton. They're distributed under the trade name Flaxine by a firm called Andersons or they come without a trade name on them at all, direct from the manufacturers, James Leavers and son of uh, Orient Mills Bolton. Anybody who sold these two items together about the 2nd October or could see someone in suspicious circumstances who might have had them or who might have had them stolen, we'd like them to come forward and speak to us. We think this might be a, a new line for the inquiry. Right, this has never been revealed in public before this information. This is the first time it has been disclosed. Now, you believe that Lawrence's body could have been dropped in Baiting's Dam on the Monday night, October the 3rd, so somebody may have seen something suspicious there. That is correct. We think that somebody might have seen something suspicious at the dam or know something about these materials that weighed the body down. Finally, as a result of the programme trailers this week, a man has already rung your incident room with some important information, you believe? It's, that's quite correct. He rang yesterday morning, he gave a name and he told us that he was going to watch the programme tonight. He said he knows of a woman who has vital information for the inquiry and he said as a result of this programme, he will contact us again. I'm appealing for that man to speak to us. It is vital he talks to us. He might be frightened as anybody else might be because of the horrific nature of the murder. But we will protect anybody and keep anything they tell us in us of confidence. Right, so if that was you, please do ring. Here's the number if anybody who thinks they can help. It's 01 811 8055 or you can call the police station at Halifax direct on 0422 337 021. That's 0422, the code for Halifax, 337 021. Our second reconstruction tonight is a case which Hampshire police have been investigating for the past 16 weeks. It's the murder of an antique jewellery and furniture dealer. 36-year-old Ricky Haywood was shot dead at his flat in Southampton on the evening of Monday the 16th of October. Detectives have some leads but not enough to trace who killed him or why. 
Before his death, Ricky had been trying to negotiate a deal on a farm property just outside Southampton at a village called Cadnam, and that's where our reconstruction now begins. Ricky Haywood dreamed of being a millionaire by the time he was 40, but he'd got into debt. He'd put a deposit of £25,000 on this three-acre farm he wanted to buy, intending to sell off the land and make a large profit. But he still needed another £55,000 before he could close the deal. On the evening of Sunday, October the 15th, Ricky took his girlfriend and his mother and sister out for a meal. He persuaded his mother to remortgage her bungalow in order to lend him some of the extra cash he wanted. Look, Mum, just go over it again. It's all right about the bungalow and the mortgage, isn't it? I've said I'll raise the money for you, Ricky, but you know half of it is Anne's. Well, I don't mind, as long as I get my money back. You'll get your money back. It's an investment, isn't it? <laughs> we'll see you all right. Ricky was obsessed with his own security. He carried a panic alarm and he'd installed video monitors bleeping continuously in his bedroom, as well as in his jewellery and antique shop underneath the flat. The following Monday morning, Ricky opened his shop, Ambience, at around half past ten as usual. Haywood? Yeah, hello. Any news? Well, I got my mother's bungalow as part of the package extra. Well, that'll help, but I think... Yes, we've got a deal, Ricky yeah? had been counting on making a deal with some financial yeah, consultants. On, say, right. Well, I'll see you about half twelve, then. Yeah, half twelve. Cheers. Bye. If you can tell me that I've got the money for this bungalow, for the farm, a, say, in writing, and a definite, then that's all right by me. We can make no promises today. The consultants told police that Ricky didn't take kindly to the news that it would take a few days to arrange things. Well, that is the very best we can do, Mr Hayward. We'll go back to the office and see what we can sort. Well, that's not good enough, is it? I... We'll see what we can sort. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Shortly after that, at about half past one, he got a call from his girlfriend. Haywood. Hi, Rick, it's me. Hello, Leslie. How is it? I don't know what these finance people want from me. What do they say? Well, I still can't raise enough cash, even with Mum's bungalow. Oh. I tell you what, Leslie, I'm going up the wall. What about later? Oh, yeah. About the meal. I think we should knock it on the head for tonight. Why? Yeah, but I'm so busy, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Yeah. Well... Well, look, I'll bring you later on and we'll talk about it then, yeah? OK, I miss you. Yeah, OK. I miss you. I love you. At 5.15, the number 3A bus was passing Ricky's shop. A passenger saw Ricky arguing with a short, fat, bald man. This man has still not been traced. A few doors up, Mr and Mrs Chester were clearing up their shop. It was five past six. Ricky was shutting up his business for the night. A man looking very much like Ricky helped him in with his sign. The police would like this man to come forward. At about the same time, a scruffy man was seen loitering near Ricky's flat. He was acting strangely and carrying something under his arm. At half past six that evening, Ricky was walking down the alleyway to his flat. No one knows whether he entered his flat alone, but he seems to have gone through his usual routine. Further up the road, Mr and Mrs Chester were still sorting out their shop. Hey, Mal. What? Like gunshots. Rubbish. 
It's just a car backfiring. Inside his flat, Ricky had been shot at point-blank range. Just about that time, an accountant was arriving to talk business with Ricky. His pronounced limp was the result of a rugby injury. Police believe the killers were still inside the flat. Anyone who saw the accountant outside Ricky's flat that evening could also have seen whoever killed Ricky Haywood. The accountant waited for five minutes before going back to his car. Oh, wait, I want a double lock. By this time, the Chesters were leaving. Mrs. Chester noticed a red car outside Ricky's shop. Right, let's go. OK. Well, Mr. Piper, those two men are obviously strong suspects. How did that witness describe them? Yes, we're very anxious to trace these two men. They're both described as in their late 20s. The first one is described as about five foot eight to nine. He was very slim, and he was wearing tight-fitting trousers and a sort of blouse-on jacket. The second man, as I've said, same age, but he was taller. He was probably about five foot 11, and he had fair hair, and he was dressed very similar to the first man. Now, the other suspicious character seen around this, that time was the man seen around the back of the shop near Ricky's flat. What description do you have of him? Yes, we're very anxious to trace this man as well because he was acting suspiciously at the back of the, at the, of the flat and uh, he was carrying something which, of course, could have been a gun. You've brought a gun into the studio, which is a replica, is it, of the, the gun you think was used to kill Ricky? Yes, this is a gun which the experts tell us is very similar to the gun that was used to kill Mr Haywood. It's uh, a small... 2-2 calibre handgun. It's quite old and probably quite warm. Right. The other person you'd like to speak to is the man who was seen from a passenger on a passing bus arguing with Ricky inside the shop. Yes, again, we want to trace this man. He was arguing with Ricky at about 5 o'clock that evening in the shop. Now, he is described as about 40 years. He was stocky and he had receding hair which was brushed straight back. Do you believe that Ricky knew whoever it was who killed him? Well, Mr. Haywood was, had bought stolen property and uh, he mixed with some rather shady characters. Uh, there was no sign of any struggle in the flat, so the indication must be that he knew who killed him. Mm. It's unfortunate, of course, that Ricky's security cameras weren't recording that night. His shop was broken into that night too. Yes, the shop was broken into that night by using, in fact, the keys which were stolen from the flat. Do you know what time that was? Well, we think that was after 7 o'clock that evening. In fact, when the shop was entered, this would have activated a blue light alarm. And this alarm was, was flashing for some time. Uh, we think that uh, it happened before half past eight and after seven o'clock. And you believe whoever broke into the shop killed Ricky? Yes, we do. Uh, whoever broke into the shop didn't steal valuable jewellery and cash. They opened the safe, but it does appear they were looking for something specific. Right, Mr Piper, thank you very much. Ricky's mother has put up a £25,000 reward for this. If there's anything at all you know which might help the police to solve the murder, please do ring us. The number here in the studio is 01811 or you can ring the Southampton Incident Room on 0703 581111. That's 0703, the code for Southampton, 581111. Our next case is a most unusual one, a crime that's over eight years old, but that only came to light eight weeks ago. What we're about to show you is nothing of the crime itself, but of the painstaking investigation that went into identifying the victim. The process led to a whole new set of questions, and hence to this appeal. Our film begins in Cardiff on the 7th of December at a house that's under renovation. Wrapped in polythene and a roll of carpet was what looked like a human skeleton. When the police had checked out the finding, a major inquiry was launched. 
Within days, 80 officers had been brought in on the case, led by Detective Chief Superintendent John Williams. We faced a dilemma at this time, having only the skeletal remains with nothing else whatsoever. We first of all sent it to an odontologist, a Dr Whitaker of Cardiff. Once one's presented with the, uh, with the specimen, uh, it's, it's important to try to get information from it without damaging it initially. And so we usually use uh, x-rays or take a radiograph like this. You can see here that inside the jaw bones and in the top jaw here as well, there are a large number of teeth that haven't yet come through into the mouth. And you can see that they are still undergoing development. And we know how long it takes for that kind of root to grow, so it's obvious that from that information we could work out exactly how old this individual was when they died. He was able to tell us that the body was that of a female, probably aged between 14 to 17 years of age, and indeed he was able further to tell us that it was probably of a young girl aged about 15 and a half to 16 years of age. It wasn't much to go on, but the police now knew not just the victim's age, but height, sex and approximate date of death. At the incident room in Norbury Road in Cardiff, a search was made of missing persons files and they began the laborious task of tracing everyone who'd lived in any of the dozen bedsits at 27 and 29 Fitzhamon Embankment where the body had been found. We then consulted Richard Neve, a medical illustrator from Manchester University. We sent him the skull and from that he was able to build up for us a facial impression from the skeleton. Using models, Richard Neve explains how the victim's face was recreated. The first thing to do is, of course, to prepare the skull so that the face can be built on it. Next stage is to take the plaster skull and then to mark 21 points over the face. And these are the sites from which measurements have been taken of soft tissue thickness. And holes are drilled in here and pegs inserted, and the pegs represent the average thickness of soft tissue to be found on the human face at these particular sites. So that means that when the face is built over the skull, it is not just a matter of imagination, it is done quite deliberately. This turned out to be a striking likeness. You may not have known this girl by name, but do you recall her from the early 1980s? This picture was issued nationwide and made front pages in South Wales. Oh, hello. I think I recognise the girl in the picture. Hello, I'm telephoning about the photograph of the girl in the paper. As a result of a massive publicity campaign, two social workers rang the incident room at Cardiff and gave us the name of the person that they thought resembled the impression. We were then able to get dental records, which we took to the odontologist, and as a result of that, we were able to identify the remains in the carpet as that of the girl, Karen Price, from Cardiff. Karen was 15 when this photograph was taken, a few months before she disappeared. She'd been in care since she was 10, but in July 1981, she absconded from the Mysa Egles Assessment Centre in Pontypridd. Very little is known about what happened to her from then on, but she was known to hang around the bus station at Wood Street, opposite Cardiff Central Railway Station. Detectives are very anxious for any help they can get from anyone who knew Karen or thinks they might have met her. This is Big Astes Cafe, just in front of the bus station. Did you eat here in the summer of 1981? When Karen had run away from homes before, and she'd done so several times, she often came here for a coffee. And in the early 80s, lots of youngsters used to hang around outside the Empire Pool in Wood Street. Do you remember Karen? Above all, did you live opposite Cardiff Arms Park, across the Taff, 
at Bedsit's in Fitzhamon Embankment. Detectives are determined to find everyone who lived here in the late 70s or early 80s, especially if you stayed in numbers 27 or 29. John Williams, there'll be people already reaching for the phones, I'm sure, and I suspect there'll be others who are hesitating, a bit worried that if they ring in, they're going to catapult themselves into the middle of a murder inquiry, might even be regarded as suspects. No, I would like to reassure these people that they would be purely treated as friendly witnesses. We are appealing for information from them, so please come forward. Now, there must have been a lot of people who knew Karen after she left my Eglois, the assessment centre in July 1981. I mean, where did she sleep? Where did she eat? Where did she wash? That's quite right. She was in and around that city centre area and someone must have befriended her and certainly seen her. And I would ask these people now, even after eight years, when they may have moved away from Cardiff, to come forward and contact us. If anybody befriended her, it might be a real friend now, and ring in. This is uh, the sort of clothes you th think she was wearing, uh, a sort of grey sweatshirt. And uh, these are very distinctive. These, uh, these jeans, distinctive really, um, they're called Carmen Gear. They're out of production now, aren't they? But that, it's the colour, quite really. right, yes. They're plum, plum coloured and there's, without a doubt, she was wearing those at the time of her death. That house again, 27, 29 Fitzhammond Embankment, which is uh, the place where she was uh, found and where you suspect uh, she might have been staying. You don't know, but we need to know anyone else who was staying there. And here's the number, 01811 The time, remember, we're talking about is summer and late summer, 1981 in particular. 01811 Or you can call the incident room in Cardiff on 0222-398-381. That's 0222, the code for Cardiff, 398-381. And that's our first case tonight. It goes back four months to Saturday, November the 11th, the day before Remembrance Sunday. Sometime during that Saturday evening, 43-year-old Carmel Gamble was murdered. Carmel was born and brought up in Stroud in Gloucestershire, so people who knew her in those days are more likely to remember her by her maiden name, Carmel O'Donnell. Five years ago, Carmel and her husband bought a cottage back near Carmel's hometown in a little village called Rodborough, just outside Stroud, but they spent most of their time at a flat they rented at Wimbledon in London. This is Church Road in Wimbledon, where Carmel lived with her husband, David. She spent a lot of her time out alone shopping, and she was a familiar sight in her clogs and loose-fitting grey wool coat, browsing around the local boutiques. How are you? She was a regular customer here. I'd like to take this one, please. OK, fine. I haven't got enough money to pay for it all now. Could I leave a deposit of £5? Yes, of course. That's lovely. Only I'm going away for a couple of weeks, so perhaps my husband could come in and pay the rest later. Fine, that's great. It'll be in a bag just behind me. All Thank right? You. Thanks very much. OK, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Carmel was an intelligent woman and very much a loner. She spent many hours in the local library, just reading. She suffered from the Slimmer's disease, anorexia nervosa, and at the time of her death, she weighed just under five stone. She'd been receiving treatment at London's St George's Hospital. Carmel herself was a chronic anorectic. Despite the best treatment, probably about a third of anorectics stay ill for a long time and Carmel had been battling with her illness for the best part of 15 years without success. Because she had chronic anorexia, she's in a state of chronic starvation, semi-starvation, so she would be alert, overactive and restless, she'd sleep poorly, she was often quite irritable and had difficulty relaxing. She was somebody who always wanted to get close to people but could never manage it. Last October, Carmel had gone to stay in their cottage in Rodborough, near Stroud, to spend a few weeks on her own. Her husband stayed at his job in London, but they'd arranged particular times when he'd phone her at the call box across the road. Hello. Fine, thanks. It's lovely down here. How's things with you? Oh, thanks very much. That's really kind of you. Bye. On Thursday, November the 9th, two days before she died, Carmel was shopping in Stroud Town Centre. Late in the afternoon, an assistant at Rumbelow's remembers her coming into the shop with a slim, middle-aged man. 
As the assistant started to move towards them, the man walked out. Can I help you? No, thank you. I think she liked to shop in the evenings, partly because it was also a time when the day was beginning to close in and she may have been feeling lonely uh, and, uh, and a bit anxious about the evening coming, and also because it was getting darker and uh, she didn't feel so self-conscious about her appearance. She lived a life of extreme routine, everything orderly, everything in its place, and that was very important to her. It gave her a sense of control. She would only eat very uh, safe foods, foods that weren't fattening, despite being hungry a lot of the time. She would stick to things like carrots and vegetables and what have you. I think her one self-indulgence is that she allowed herself some fruit gums at the end of a meal. And even there, she was very strict with herself. She'd only allow herself one colour, for instance, not allow herself the whole packet. She was a very self regulating individual. Saturday the 11th of November, the day of Carmel's death. As usual, it was getting towards closing time as Carmel started her shopping. At about half past four, she called in at a haberdashery shop in Stroud called So-and-So. I'd like six of these buttons, Thank please. please. Carmel always came in on her own. She very rarely had uh, people with her. The only time I remember her in the shop with anyone else was her husband. And I'll take this one. She was never with other friends, you know, lady friends or anything. She always seemed very sad, quiet, no conversation. She would sometimes pay by cash, often by cheque, even small amounts she would buy on cheque you know, a couple of pounds, that sort of thing. She was regular, so that was no problem. About half an hour later, she was in Boots in the High Street. Can I help you? Yes, please. Thank you. The manageress had to wait for Carmel before she could cash up. That manageress is the last person known to have seen Carmel alive. Police don't know exactly how she got home that evening. She may have caught a taxi from Stroud Town Centre, but it would have been more typical of her to have walked the mile back to the cottage. The next morning, a local resident saw somebody in the phone box. They remember the door was slightly ajar. 20 minutes later, a neighbour saw smoke. Someone had tried to set light to the cottage. The fire brigade found Carmel's body inside. And once again, that was the morning of Sunday, the 12th of November. Mr. Pierce is in charge of this case. Have you any idea what the motive for killing Carmel might have been? No, we haven't. Our inquiries to date have failed to reveal any specific motive whatsoever. But what I can say, this was a particularly vicious and brutal murder, and the violence was such that we have put together a psychological uh, a profile of the offender in order to help us uh, discover the type of person we're looking for. There seemed to be certainly a lot of anger in the attack. There was an extreme amount of anger. You haven't found the murder weapons yet? No, Karma Gamble was killed as a result of multiple blows to the head by a heavy, rounded, blunt instrument, and also her body was mutilated by a sharp instrument, very likely a knife. And despite uh, extensive searches, we have failed to locate either of these weapons. And also, strangely, her woolen coat is missing too. Yes, it is. Um, she was known to wear a heavy woolen type overcoat um, about Stroud and other towns, and we have failed to find that. It is certainly not in the house, either in Stroud or London. Is there any reason why you can think it might have been stolen? It may be the murderer put it on in order to hide bloodstained clothing. Now, she and her husband kept themselves very much to themselves. They didn't have many friends. But she was seen in Rumbelow's with somebody that day by the shop assistant. What description did that shop assistant give of him? Yes, he described her as a white, white male person, approximately 45 years of age, 5 foot 4 tall, slim build, and wearing a light grey uh, herringbone type jacket, together with a dark grey pullover. And he was in Rumbelow's in Stroud two days before she died? Yes, he was. Are there any other suspects? Yes, there are two other persons that we're interested in. And one is described by a witness as a uh, young white male sitting on a bench at approximately 2.30 a.m. in the morning of Sunday the 12th, uh, just yards from uh, Carmel Gamble's house. Uh, he had his head in his hands, and by the side of him had a white plastic bag, which looked upright as though it had something in it. 
And the question to be asked, did that co have a container with paraffin type accelerant in it, which was used to set fire to the house? That must we have been an unusual sight in a small village at 2.30 in the morning. Yes, we obviously need to trace and identify that person as soon as possible. The other person, presumably, is the one in the phone box seen just before the fire at Carmel's cottage was discovered. Yes, it is. Uh, that person is described uh, as wearing a long uh, woolen type coat, overcoat, with the door slightly ajar. And as is it directly opposite the house, uh, was this an innocent telephone user or was it indeed the murderer looking at the house and awaiting the development of the fire before leaving the scene? So, well, Mr Pierce, thank you very much indeed. If that was you, and if you are an innocent phone caller, please do phone and be eliminated from the inquiries. The number, if you can help, 01811-8055, 01811-8055. Or you can call the police station at Stroud direct on 0453 766 311. That's 0453, the code for Stroud, 766311. Our last case tonight is the murder of a man who didn't seem to have an enemy in the world. But as the crime statistics clearly show, in the vast majority of cases, murder is committed by someone known to the victim. And police feel that this is likely to prove true in this case. Keith Burgess was 39 years old, unmarried, and he'd been living in the Clifton area of Bristol for the past four years. And it's there, shortly before Christmas, that our reconstruction takes place. Keith Burgess had close ties with his local church, All Saints in Clifton. He was often a server at Mass. He seems to have been well-liked by everyone who knew him. Keith worked for British Rail as a steward, mostly on intercity services between London and the South West. And because he travelled so much, he had acquaintances in many parts of the country. Keith was a lovely man. Yeah, I don't think many people who have come across him would ever have met anybody who was quite that easy to get on with. Keith was amazingly charming, easygoing person, very efficient at his job. Um, just generally a pleasure to know. I've never known anybody have a bad word to say about him, and certainly none of the customers. Great knack at putting people at their ease, entertaining yeah. people. Have a drink, have another drink. Drinks. Orange juice, please. Orange juice? I need orange juice. Just you look like the kind of lady like a gin and tonic. Well, I knew he was gay, but it didn't really matter at all because the guy's too nice for anything to matter. Thank you. OK, anybody else? Tea's, coffees. Okay, tea's, coffees. Anybody for tea? Sunday, the 17th of December. It was the last Sunday before Christmas weekend. Keith nearly always went to Mass on Sundays when he wasn't working. In fact, he'd taken sick leave for the past week, but he was due back on duty that afternoon. Hello, Keith. How are you this morning? No, I'm a bit tired. I've been under the weather with the flu. Well, you're not over that flu yet. It's terrible, isn't it? Yeah, you I'm back to work today. <laughs> Got to go to work this afternoon. Yeah, this afternoon. Yes. Never let you lot this. <laughs> I'll see you Friday, I'll be so happy. Oh, you're on Friday? That's jolly good. OK, take care. God bless. Look after yourself. Hello, Keith. Are you going home now? Well, I'm going to pop in for a quick drink at the pub. Do you want to come? Oh, no, no, no. another time, perhaps. <laughs> okay, yes. see, see you later. Bye. Yes, bye. I'm just going to have a drink. All right, goodbye. Bye. It was about a quarter past twelve when Keith walked round the corner to the pub, as he often did after church. He was there for less than half an hour. No one actually remembers seeing Keith leave the pub but it was around 20 to 1 when he started off on the short walk to his home in Duchess Road. It would have been just around this time that a BBC producer noticed a man on the steps leading from Keith's basement flat. He was wearing a blue and white woolen hat and carrying two bags, one white and one green, possibly a Marks and Spencer bag. The man was conspicuous for his most peculiar behaviour. He very nervously started trying to hide his face. 
Once at the corner of Duchess Road and All Saints Road, he seemed to stop and wait. Mrs. Betty Taylor lives in the ground floor flat above Keith's. That Sunday lunchtime, she was at home with a friend grooming her dog. Good girl now, aren't you? Now keep still, just for a little bit longer. She's nearly dry now. Yes. That must be Keith. I'll give him those presents. All right. I'll see you in a minute. Come on, let me try over here. Mrs. Taylor had known Keith for ten years through the church, and they were close friends. She used to look after his flat for him whenever he was away. There was a connecting staircase between their flats. Keith? Where are you? Hello, Betty. I brought these presents that were left for you. Thank you. I can't stay. I've got Janet upstairs. Are you expecting anybody? No, I'm just off to work. OK, then. Cheerio. Hello. Come in. Mrs. Taylor didn't see who was at the door, but she had the impression that it was someone Keith knew. About half an hour later, she heard Keith's front yes, door slam. Finished. You're very yes. good. Yes. That must be Keith going. Is that him coming up the stairs? Mm, no. He must be packing his things still. Now. Keith was due to start work on the two o'clock train from Bristol to London. Staff delayed the train for three minutes waiting for Keith to arrive. The train departed without him. Later that Sunday afternoon, Keith Burgess was found dead in his flat. He'd been beaten and stabbed. And the date was Sunday the 17th of December. Mr Barry Stone, that man in the blue and white hat, must surely be the person who killed Keith Burgess. I think there's little doubt that that's right. And of course we are extremely anxious to identify just who he is. Now theft wasn't the motive, but did Keith in fact have any enemies as far as you know? Well, he was a, an extremely sociable person. He had friends and acquaintances throughout the country. He was homosexual. His acquaintances and friends were amongst the homosexual communities. He spent the majority of his time in gay clubs and also public houses, not only in Bristol, but elsewhere. He was very outgoing, and I feel confident that if there was ill feeling between him and someone else, then he would have toured one of his acquaintances or his friends and I would appeal to that person to come forward and give that information to us. He did spend a lot of time in bars, didn't he? Yes, he did. Around Bristol and, and various areas. Yes, certainly London was another place, but uh, he was travelling from as far afield as Penzance to Dundee. Mm. And as you say, he was a very open, chatty person, so if there had been any problems in his life, he could well have perhaps discussed it with one of the people he met I him. feel sure that he would have shared that information with someone else, and I think that person would be doing everyone a favour if they came to us with that information. In fact, you know that he received three quite significant phone calls during the last week before his death. Yes, he did, and we're confident that those phone calls were made by the same person. There was one phone call during the early hours of the Tuesday prior to his death. There were two phone calls between 6 and 9 p.m. on the Wednesday prior to his death. We'd like to speak to the person who made those phone calls. It is, of course, quite possible that they are not related to his murder at all, but we would like to speak to that person. There is some suggestion that the subject of the phone calls was, in fact, an argument. And anyone who does wish to come forward who, who knew Keith will, will be guaranteed discretion from you. The gay community in Bristol have been quite complimentary about the manner in which we've dealt with this inquiry, and we would guarantee anyone absolute discretion. Now, since we made our reconstruction there, another witness has come forward with a new clue. Yes, we know that on Friday the 15th, that was two days before the murder, he was in the Marble Arch area of London where he had lunch with someone. We'd like to speak to that person and also anybody else who saw him in London on that day. Right. You also believe that two significant articles may be missing now from Keith's flat. Yes, we know that uh, the week previous to his death, 
Certainly there was a file of facts in the flat and also an album of photographs. Now the album of photographs may indeed belong to someone else and not Keith Burgess. Certainly neither item was there at the time of his death uh, when we searched the premises and we're extremely anxious to trace both items. But those, both those items could hold vital clues. They could indeed. Well, Mr Stone, thank you very much indeed. If you have any idea, first of all, who that man in the woolen hat might be, or if you can shed any light at all on who might have wanted to kill Keith, please do let us know. Your call will be treated with absolute discretion. You can speak to Detective Superintendent Stone or to a BBC researcher here if you prefer, or you can ring Mr Stone's colleagues at the King's Western Incident Room in Bristol on 0272 267 870. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 267 870. Our next case is one that's been baffling to almost everyone concerned with it. Sarinda Gill was an insurance broker who lived in Southall near Heathrow Airport. This video was taken at a family wedding. Here, as always, Sarinda was the life and soul of the party. Early on Tuesday, January the 30th, Sarinda was found stabbed to death in his car. Now, at first it seemed as though he and his vehicle had been hijacked. As more witnesses came forward, though, the events of Mr Gill's last hours have become more and more mysterious. It's Monday the 29th of January. Southall, west of London, has a thriving Asian community. For most of the last 25 years, Sarinda Gill has lived here. Right, none of us like maths, but you still have to do it. He began yeah. the day as usual, ferrying his daughter and his brother's two children to school. I suggest you that you uh, pull your socks up. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Right. Sarinda had done right. well since he himself left then? school. He clearly prospered. Come on, he up, drove yeah. an expensive, customised Mercedes. Yeah. Mr. Gill had acquired a distinctive number plate reflecting both his name and his personality. He was yeah. flamboyant, image no, conscious, and drew attention to himself. No his all. car was virtually his office, <laughs> and much of his yeah, business yeah. was conducted on his mobile phone. Yeah, if that's the policy you want, then that's the way I'll arrange it. Not at all. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Bye. He was regarded as a charmer and was well known in the neighbourhood. At lunchtime, Sarinda had bought some sandwiches and chips, but he never got to finish them. A few moments later, he was noticed by Bobby Charner, who works at this chemist shop in South Road. A few seconds after this, something extraordinary happened to Sarinda Gill. It must have taken place somewhere down this high street. Were you in South Road, South Hall, at 2 o'clock on Monday the 29th of January? Did you see an unusual incident involving a maroon Mercedes? At one minute past two, a business associate rang Sarinda in his car. Hello, Mr Gill. Hi, it's Mr Hill. I've got uh, the, the file in connection with your property. Can I come and see you now? No, you can't actually come and see us today. You can come and see us tomorrow. The account is not in today. Disconnect. Disconnect. Mr Gill. Mr. Mr. Gill? Whatever happened in or near South Road, within moments, Surrender's car was seen half a mile away in Merrick Road. It's now a mile and a half away at ten past two on Greenford Road. That's strange. The guy in the car over there is wearing a crush helmet. Half a mile further up Greenford Road, the car was seen to turn around and head back towards South Hall. Beaver's open space in Hounslow, a witness saw a big red car drive across the playing field beside Green Lane.
It's possible the car remained here for half an hour or more. Do you remember seeing it? And what was going on? Sarinda failed to collect his daughter from her school. Whatever happened to Mr Gill that afternoon, one witness says he reappeared that evening at Gillette Corner. At 6.45, as though nothing in the world was wrong, he turned up at the Comet Warehouse in Cyan Lane. I'm having a lot of problems with this, a lot of interference. Do you think you can sort something out for me? Sure, how about the NC9A? Yeah, good price? Good price. Good model? Good model. <laughs> right, listen, I haven't got a lot of time now. I've got to meet somebody in Southall. When should we meet? Thursday, two o'clock. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'll see you on Thursday then, yeah? OK, don't worry about the price. Right, do me a good model. I'll see you on Thursday. No problem, see you later. Several people had tried to ring Surrender, but couldn't get through. His family was now worried, especially since he'd failed to collect his daughter from her school. His car was seen at 7.30 and again at 9.30 in Southall. But where was Mr Gill? Seven o'clock next morning back at Beaver's open space off Green Lane, Hounslow. John Wilford was exercising his horse, Kestrel. A man was slumped in the front passenger seat. Surinder Gill had been attacked in the car by at least two men, and though he'd plainly struggled, he'd been stabbed to death. Stuart Hull, what on earth was going on? It seemed he was hijacked, and yet there he is, nonchalantly, apparently turning up at a shop to try and buy a phone. Yes, well, it is very baffling, but uh, what I think happened was that he was in some way overpowered that afternoon, just after two o'clock, in the area of South Road. Uh, he was either hijacked or, or kidnapped, call it what you will, but something drastic happened to him at about two o'clock that afternoon. And what I'm anxious to do is to find anybody who saw that actual incident. Now, we've had nobody yet who's actually seen the men in the crash helmets get into the car. OK, let's make it clear. This is Monday the 29th of January. Yes. And we're talking about 2 p.m. or a few moments thereafter. Yes. And it's uh, South Road, possibly Merrick Road, that sort of area. Yes. In Southall. That's right. And what would, what would people have seen, do you think? Well, it's possible that uh, the, the men in the crash helmets actually jumped into the car and overpowered Surinder. And, I mean, to see anybody get into a car carrying crash helmets is very unusual and should mm -hmm have struck a bell with somebody. It should, okay. have, should have lodged in somebody's mind. Then the car disappears, and so does Surinder. Yes. Um, after about 3.30 uh, there's, a, there's a two-hour time gap where we, don't, we have no sightings of the car in the afternoon between 3.30 and 5.30. And uh, we're, it's possible that the car was parked up somewhere during that time, and obviously we would like anybody who saw the car during that time to come forward. And presumably you need to contact all his acquaintances. Anybody who knew Surinder Gill? Yes, that's right. Um, you described in, in the film that Surinder was a flamboyant character, and uh, indeed he was. And he had his faults just like the rest of us. But what I would like to say is that his murder has, has, has left a terrible scar on the family. And the family in the Indian culture is at the, at the center of, of their lives. Um, now, something has happened that's destroyed this family. They've put up a £5,000 reward, and I would ask anybody out there who's got any information to come forward so that in some way this family can start to repair the damage that's been done. OK, well, if you knew Surinder Gill, if you saw his car on that day, 16 GLL, it's a very a distinctive uh, number plate, uh, do please, if you haven't yet spoken to the police, do get in touch. This is uh, part of a video of Surinder taken three months before his death. There he is in the white. Here's the number, 01811-8055. Or you can try the incident room in Sunbury on Thames. That's 01577-4481. That's 01577-4481. Our first case is about the tragic death of a man described by almost everyone as pleasant, charming, cultured and intelligent. A slightly shy man, apparently without an enemy in the world, Murray Erskine. Sometime last December, probably on the evening of Friday the 15th, he was murdered. The Royal Opera House at Covent Garden. 
Sorry I was a bit late. Not to worry, we've got plenty of time. Have a glass of wine first, shall we? Murray Erskine came here frequently. Indeed, back home, he had a big collection of classical records. He was also something of a wine buff. Back at his flat, he had a store of almost 500 fine bottles. Is the Sancerre the 87? It is indeed, sir. We'll have a bottle of that one then, please. Right, sir. Perfect. He lived by himself in a basement in Norland Square in London's Notting Hill. He was regarded as a quiet and pleasant neighbour. Most of Murray's friends knew that he was gay. Few knew that he also had a streak of masochism. That could well be connected to his death. Just around the corner is the Norland Arms. The publican remembers Murray being there sometime in November. Pint of brow, please. Murray used to come in to the pub two or three times a week. Not every week, never at the weekends. Yeah, it's 150, please. There we are. Thank you very much. Cheers. He often came in on his own. And on occasions, he was joined by uh, a young couple. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Cheers. It was my impression that these meetings were prearranged. The couple, um, well, they looked like a professional couple on their way home from work. They were uh, both smartly dressed and would stay and chat with Murray for about half an hour. Shortly after the couple left, another man would join Murray. He would sit down and Murray would uh, get up and uh, get him a drink, usually a half pint of lager. Uh, I first saw this friend of uh, Murray's in October, and the last time I saw him with Murray was mid-November last year. Well, they used to stay for about half an hour, and they, they would leave together. So, How's two days this? before Murray disappeared, he invited a friend Hi. round to his flat for dinner. Well, I'm dying to tell you. You know my friend, the Rhodesian? Oh, yes. Is he still around? As a matter of fact, he is, and he's coming to see me on Friday night. That Friday morning, Murray went to work as usual. You could almost set the clock by him, leaving for the city at 8.30 and returning home promptly at 6.45. It's not known if Murray Erskine ever reached his home that night. Did the Rhodesian come to visit him? Did Murray come home to change and then go out again? Did you see him anywhere that Friday night? The next day, Murray's access card and checkbooks were used in London's West End. Someone who may have had a beard went into Austin K on the Strand. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, can I help you at all? Yes. Can I look at that watch, please? Yes, certainly. It's quite a rare watch, actually. There are only 350 of those in the country. And how much is it? Well, it's usually 225, but we're selling it for 200 pounds. Okay, that'll be fine. That's what I'm looking for. Good. Do you take access? Yes, we do. I'll just get this authorised. One cute moment. Okay. The name's Erskine. It expires August 1990. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Two days later, just around the corner, London's Charing Cross Hotel. Someone booked a hire car under the name of Murray Erskine. He must have had to wait outside the hotel for an hour or so since the driver had first gone to the wrong hotel. Hi, I think this is for me. Oh, you are from the exit. Sorry, I'm so late. I'm oh, that's the wrong right. place. Don't worry. Um, if you'd like to get in, let's fill out some paperwork. I won't give you long. Right then. Um, could I have your driving license, please, sir? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And uh, can I have your access card, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Erskine. Everything seems to be in order. I hope you enjoy the car. Shouldn't have any problems with it. Last right, time. Bye bye. Thanks. The delivery driver noticed the man sat in the car for about five minutes before driving off. 
During that week before Christmas, between Monday the 18th of December and Thursday the 21st, Murray's access card and checkbook were used frequently, always in London's West End. The red Fiesta was dropped off as arranged on Thursday morning, just behind King's Cross Station. From the mileage, the car had clearly been driven outside London. Several days elapsed over the Christmas and New Year period, and then here at London's Liverpool Street Station, Murray's card and chequebook were used again. Can I have £50 pounds worth of guilders, please? Can I have a five-day return ticket to Holland, please? Yeah, uh, £50. Pounds. Around now, Murray Erskine's bank had recognised his writing had been forged, and soon after this, his access card was blocked. When someone tried to use it Thank in you. the Netherlands, it was seized. The River Cam in Cambridgeshire, near Ely. From two days before Christmas, there had been several sightings of a large black plastic bag that was floating in the water near this new pub the five miles from anywhere. At least three witnesses thought it was a body, but no one told the police. Until three months later, these two were sailing on a day trip down the river. If you saw Murray Erskine on Friday the 15th of December after you left work or any time after that, please do call us. Laurie Vanner, I, I gather you've had a tremendous amount of cooperation and particularly from the gay community. That's quite correct. Um, the inquiry has taken us into a number of gay clubs, pubs and bars and in fact we've received nothing but the best of cooperation there. We, have to, we do know that uh, Mr Erskine met this man as a result of an advert in a contact magazine here in London. We know that the man was into S&M and CP, both expressions which members of the gay community will understand. And we don't believe that um, Mr Erskine is the only man which this Rhodesian could have met. I have to ask you this, I mean, how discreet are you going to be if somebody rings up and uh, we what they call a closet gay, their family, friends don't know? We understand that people may feel vulnerable and reluctant to come forward, but we really do guarantee absolute discretion. OK, the couple in the pub who were meeting Murray sometime October or, or November, you need to find them. Obviously, they've got nothing to do with the crime, except that they might know who he was meeting later on. It would certainly seem that uh, their presence in the pub coincided with the visits of this other man. Uh, they may have seen him. Mr Erskine may well have spoken about him. Let's see we this uh, other man. What do we know about him? We've, he's been described to us as being in his mid-30s, about six foot tall, slightly above average build. Um, his hair is dark, down to his uh, collar and he's got an indistinct accent. Okay, now we also have a, a video fit of a man who was seen, uh, that's a description in fact from the hire car delivery driver, a, it could well be the chap who, who bought the watch as well. Not dissimilar. It's not dissimilar, that man was described to us as being in his early 30s, 5 foot 11 tall, about average build, um, it's a well trimmed beard and moustache with nice curly dark brown hair. Uh, clearly we need to find anybody who knows someone who could be known as the Rhodesian. That's correct. Erskine referred to him as the Rhodesian or my Rhodesian friend. We only know from things that Mr Erskine told his colleagues that um, the man had served in the Rhodesian army, possibly in their version of the SAS, coming back to England after independence. Or at least he said he had. That's I correct. Don't know whether he had or not, presumably. Incidentally, this is uh, one of the Seiko Yachtmaster watches. Uh, there are only 350 of these in the country. If you know someone who's got one of those, particularly in conjunction with one of these, which is a watch cover case, and in conjunction possibly with one of these too, which is a Euro belt pouch, something he might wear around his waist. And then do give us a call, particularly if any of the descriptions match or anything else seems odd to you. Here's the number, if you can help in any way, 081, remember the new code, 811-8055, 081-811-8055. Or you can try the instant room at Kensington, which is Greater London, that's 081-741-6022. That's 081-741-6022. Our next case is a murder in which the killer, or an accomplice, seems to have tried to contact the police. Detectives have a tape recording of a man's voice, they have samples of handwriting, and they have an insight into the suspect's personality, which it must be said seems slightly weird. Indeed, the police think that there's a real chance the murderer might call Crime Watch while we're on the air. If so, there are details that only he knows which will prove that he was really at the scene of the killing. The police now want to see if you can help make the pieces fit together and maybe fit someone that you know. The victim was an eminent doctor, a skin specialist who lived in Middlesbrough. 
David Burkett was consultant dermatologist at the Carter Bequest Hospital, though he also held surgeries in four other hospitals in South well, Cleveland. He was a dedicated NHS doctor who'd specialised in skin disorders for nearly 30 years. It will take some time to clear up. But anyway, I'm going to prescribe some... David was also one of the UK's half-dozen figures in the field of paleopathology, the study of ancient human bones, and he was a consultant to the government. Come on, then. Tell us all about it. About what? Operation Thingamy. Valley. A weekend of adventure in the great outdoors. Well, when we got back... He was modest about his achievements and very popular in Linthorpe, even though many of his friends didn't feel they really knew him. David, from what I know of him... Um, was a very private person. I think that was the most outstanding facet of his personality. He was a very kind man. He'd frequently stop to talk to people that nobody else would bother with. Over the last few years, we've got to know David a little bit better because he started to come out with several of the neighbours, my husband and myself, on a regular basis. On the Wednesday before David died, we... All had arranged to go to the bowling club and David had gone to Durham that evening and as normal he came in about two minutes just before the quiz started. You must have driven very fast to get down from Durham. Yes, I did. My goodness, it's cold out there too. Is it really? It is. Yes, I'll Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start the quiz now. The first question is How do frogs breathe underwater? We know the answer to that, don't we? Second question, where are the heights of Abraham? Oh, I know that one. In the group, he had the best intellect out of all of us, really. He had an outstanding intellect, general knowledge and ability. It's the day of his death, Saturday the 3rd of February. David was divorced and lived alone, and his routine on Saturdays was to go down to the shops. A oh, virgin flight brochure, please. Right, there you go. Oh, thank you. Is it business or pleasure this time? Oh, a bit of both, really. I'm taking my daughter with me on a trip to America. Oh, very good. When you got your date sorted, give us a ring. That will do. Thank Cheerio. You. Bye-bye. Dr Burkett was seen in several other shops in Linthorpe and in Middlesbrough Town Centre before returning home to Cornfield Road. He lived here for 13 years, three of them alone, though he saw a good deal of his former wife and children. He began to prepare his evening meal, and at about 20 past five, one of his neighbors cycling down the lane adjoining David's house saw him sitting alone in his kitchen. It was the last time David Burkett is known to have been seen alive. Nearly an hour later, at about ten past six, this witness, a local farmer, noticed someone sitting on David's next-door neighbour's garden wall. David usually went out with friends on Saturday night, but by 6.30 he'd still not been in touch to make arrangements. I telephoned, but there was no reply. At 20 past seven, there was nearly an accident near David's house. Bloody stupid thing to do. About ten to eight, I ran to David's house and dropped a note in the door, asking him would he let me know by nine o'clock what he was going to do that night. And then I went down the side of the house, where I noticed that the kitchen windows were all steamed up. I was a little bit concerned because I felt I could smell burning potatoes. An hour later, a witness waiting for a bus saw someone in the phone box in Union Street at the junction of Parliament Road. It's some 15 minutes walk from David's house. Someone from this phone box dialed 999 and implied there'd been a murder. The witness saw a man use the phone box three times, but only saw him speak once. He remembers the man walked away down Parliament Road. Hello? It's Frank. I've tried to get David two or three times on the phone. There's no answer. What do you want to do this evening? 
Well, I think we should do our normal and stick to our normal plan in that we go along to the theatre club. And David may come along at quarter past ten. David join never did join his friends at the little theatre club that Saturday night. And the next day, Sunday the 4th of February, his body was discovered in his home. He'd been beaten to death. Brian Leonard, obviously you need to eliminate that man who was seen by the phone boxes from where the 999 call was made. Yes, we do indeed. He's 35 to 45 years of age. He's medium built, six feet tall, and he was dressed in a dark anorak. Okay, fairly distinctive features. You want him to call. It could be the man who dialed 999, of course, but there's no way of telling. That's right. He may well not be connected with the murder. Okay. But obviously we need to trace and eliminate him from the inquiry. Now, not only did someone ring the police, but someone uh, wrote this letter to you. Now, this is the, the first page of it, which is uh, stenciled, and I, I gather people who know about stencil say it's, it's f fairly well done. That's right. This next page is more interesting. It's got uh, a verse here, which seems about martial arts. Heaven and earth are my parents, Psyche, Tandon is my home, Stoicism is my body. Very interesting, this line here. I can throw my life away at an instant. Can you? Yes, we've received many anonymous letters, but it, because of the, the content of this particular letter, we're rather interested in finding the author of it. It's very important with, uh, that we find the there were writer of the letter. details in this that suggested he really knew inside that house that he knew something about the Indeed crime. Indeed he did, and uh, about the activities of the doctor himself. And you think that the murderer or the accomplice might actually ring the programme now? That is always a strong possibility. We cannot discount that. OK. Obviously, whoever rings up, they'll be asked if they can give us details which will prove they are what they say they are. Uh, a skull is missing, one of the, the skulls that uh, the doctor was working on at the time. Yes, this is a skull he'd had in the house for some considerable time. It had damage to the left eye and to the rear of the skull. And obviously we need to find that skull. He, was, he used it for lecturing purposes. He may have loaned it out, but of course the killer may have taken it from the house. OK. And this bag was found uh, This was found house. in the house, near to the body. It was left by the murderer. We've checked and uh, with the occupants of the house, the cleaner, it certainly wasn't there before Dr. Burkett was killed. Okay, in itself not of course very useful, but if you can link it together with uh, other things. Remember, this killing is, is a very brutal and very weird one, and the killer might strike again. Please help if you can, 081 811 8055. That's 081 811 8055. Or if you want to ring the Middlesbrough local incident room, try 0642 300 200. That's 0642, the code for Middlesbrough, 300 200. Our first appeal is the murder of a child, and it's a case in which at least one other child has been sexually assaulted by the same man. We appealed on the case on incident desk back in March, but detectives are no further forward, and they need all the help they can get to prevent another child falling victim to the same attacker. During the film you're about to see, please bear in mind that because of the rules which exist to protect performers under the age of 16, the actors taking the roles of the two children are and look older than the roles they're playing. Our reconstruction begins in Brixton in South London. Wayne Taylor lived with his mother a couple of miles from here in Kennington. But his father lived in Brixton, and Wayne often came here to see him and spend time with friends. Wayne looked much older than his 11 years and liked to seem cool and streetwise. He would sometimes stay out quite late at night. I'll go just make a call. Yeah, I'll go ring this girl. He usually rang home to let the family know where he was. Yes, yeah, me. No, no, I'm staying at Dad's tonight. He said it's, he, yeah, he said it's all right. Hey, start, hurry up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's waiting. I'll call you later on. All right. Hey, what are you doing, man? Uh, she can't make it. Ah, uh, start. You're you spoiling so your long, mum, man. innit? Don't be serious. No, don't, don't lie, son. You're spoiling her. No, if I ring my mum, I'll tell you. You know what I mean? I'll be like, don't worry. What's she saying? You're allowed to stay up? No, don't be serious. I'm going to ring my mum. It's all lying, or it's all lying. Ah, no, I can ring my mum. By contrast, Wayne spent his weekdays in Buckinghamshire at a special weekly boarding school for children with difficulties. There he'd really begun to thrive. Wayne was very friendly and trusting. He had a very acute sense of humour. He liked to be in the centre of all the activities 
really enjoyed the social side of school life. He was the largest boy in school. He protected the younger children and he was the most popular child. Wayne was doing extremely well. Before he arrived here, he had a problem where his classroom attitudes and attainments had deteriorated, but he made very good use of the placement here, and uh, we were proud to have him. He was a, a leading light at this school. The day Wayne died was the first day of the half-term holiday, Monday the 19th of February. He was back in London, and at lunchtime he met up with his best friend in Kennington. He set off to look for his father in Brixton, but his father wasn't in. At around four o'clock that afternoon, someone who looked like Wayne was seen near Southwick House, a council estate in Brixton. Someone else says they saw him on the first floor landing at the estate at around that time. Could he have been meeting someone there? It is known for certain that around four o'clock he was in nearby Atlantic Road. He called into a grocer's shop where he knew his father often went. Have uh, you seen my dad? No, I haven't seen him for the evening. Are you sure you ain't seen him? No, he ain't been in here yet for the evening. All right, can you tell him I'm around? I'm looking for it. OK, all right. Wayne went back to that shop twice more between six and seven o'clock that evening, but his father still wasn't there. It was around seven o'clock that Wayne was last seen, still in Atlantic Road. Later that night, Wayne's mother reported him missing to the police. Two days later, back at Southwick House, two police officers on a routine patrol of the estate looked into a disused community centre. <laughs> Dick, Dick, Dennis. What's up? Come on, mate. Wake up. You can't stay there. He's dead, mate. Better get on to the Delta One. Wayne had been sexually assaulted and suffocated. In the four months since then, the Murder Squad incident room in South London has been following up all possible clues, including those provided by Crime Watch viewers. They've talked to more than a thousand people and taken 250 statements, but the results have been frustrating. With one exception, they turned up a vital new lead when they looked into an attack on a nine-year-old boy in Brixton eight months before. 20th of June, 1989 an after-school game of football near Southwick House, where Wayne Taylor was later found murdered. One nine-year-old boy played on well into the evening. It wasn't until just before midnight that he started walking home along Brixton Hill. It was so quick, I tried to scream, but his arm got tighter around my neck. He was pushing me, forcing me, to the back of the alley. He was very strong. He pushed me between the cars. I started screaming, then he grabbed me by the neck again. I fell down. He said his name was Derek. Hello? Who's down there? Oh, what's going on down there? Daddy. Oh my God, are you all right? What's happened? What's happened? Daddy. <coughs> oh, hang on, I'll come down. Oh, my God, are you hurt? Did you see him? Are you all right? Where does it hurt? Oh, there's nobody down there. Did you see him? No, all right. Can you stand? Oh, <laughs> gently does it. We'll take him upstairs and I'll okay. call an ambulance. Come on, gently does oh. it. That's it. We've got you. Oh. Oh. I've got you, okay. mate. Okay. Right, I'll open the door. 
that nine-year-old boy had been seriously sexually assaulted. The results of genetic tests on samples of semen from that attack have now provided vital new evidence in the investigation into the murder of Wayne Taylor. We took the samples from the clothing of the boy from Brixton Hill and compared them to the samples found on the body of Wayne Taylor. This line here shows the samples taken from the body of Wayne Taylor and this one here, the boy tacked on Brixton Hill. If we lay the samples side by side, we can see that the two bands are in exactly the same position. This test and some more detailed tests we did showed us that one man was definitely responsible for both attacks and the chances of that not being the situation is one in a hundred million. For quite some time after the death of Wayne Taylor, the children here were horrified and devastated by his loss. Particularly those from the South London area felt that they were in danger of being snatched off the street and assaulted and attacked. Um, they needed a lot of reassurance. This is Wayne's dormitory. And this is Wayne's bed over here. It's not been slept in since he's been gone. This is Wayne's teddy. He used to give it to boys who were that sad and upset and wanted a bit of comfort. And they used to just cuddle that. Well, remember, Wayne was actually much younger than our actor. We're talking here about two children aged nine and 11. Bill Lavers is in charge of this investigation. Wayne was a popular lad. He had a lot of friends. He was very trusting. Would he be the sort of boy to go off with somebody he didn't know? No, he wasn't that sort of boy. But he was looking for his dad. And if somebody approached him and said they knew where his dad was, it's possible he might have gone off with them. So what happened after 7 o'clock that night is crucial. Yeah, that's crucial. We know the boy was last seen at 7. The good witness saw him at 7. By 11, he's dead. It's important that we see anybody who saw Wayne after 7 o'clock. You found a receipt for a trapper hat beside Wayne's body. Yes, this is a, the receipt from the Combined Services Supply and in Atlantic Road. It relates to one of these hats, a trapper hat. We know Wayne Taylor had a trapper hat that was stolen by two boys sometime previously, and it's possible that someone purchased him a hat to befriend him. So that could be a vital clue. Yes, it could. What appeals are there now as a result of the link you've made with the attack on the little boy a year ago? Well, the boy a year ago was playing football in the, in the vicinity of Southwick House, so anybody who can remember in June of last year, uh, a nine-year-old boy walking up Brixton Hill, possibly being followed by a man, and also I want to trace the two people who went to his assistance after the attack. And most important of all, we have a description of him now. Yes, we have. He's a black man. Um, he's about five foot four, in his early 20s. Um, he did say his name was Derek during the attack. He was wearing a T-shirt um, with a woodpecker on it. You're obviously very worried about this case. Yes, I am. Uh, these attacks uh, both took place within the space of eight months. This man's got to be caught. I have the evidence. I need his identity. Right. There is, remember, a concern for the safety of other children here. Please do ring. There are BBC researchers manning the phones if you prefer not to speak to a police officer. And the number to ring here is 081 811 8055. The direct line to the Lambeth incident room is this, 071 230 5815. That's 071 230 5815. That's where we start, a case that seems not so much a crime of passion, but a calculated killing. The events took place in North London and in Essex, and you'll see there are several people who have to be eliminated from the inquiry. The victim was Lee Parsons. Lee Parsons was 43 and lived in Free and Barnet. Her pride and joy was her white Golf GTI convertible. Lee worked three shifts a week as a masseuse at the New Experience Sauna in Evershot Street in Camden Town. 
She'd worked here for 12 years, though all her colleagues knew her as Debbie. It's Saturday the 23rd of June. Around lunchtime, Lee went out with her boyfriend, Ozzy, whom she'd been seeing for two years. There you go, horoscopes. Yes. The new moon is influencing all forms of communication and travel plans. Lee had lent Ozzy some money to start Lee Oz restaurant in Harlow, Essex, about half an hour's drive from Free and Barnet. Tonight, Ozzy was expecting a big party, and Lee had promised to help out. Oh, what a pong in here. It's so dark. I'm going to put a bit of light in there. They never get this thing working. Here are the tablecloths, Lee. Oh, thanks, babe. About ten miles away towards London, near Epping Forest, a woman was driving to the shops. I slowly went down my lane, and I noticed two cars with two fellows. And um, it's usually an area where people might stop to walk dogs or have something to, you know, have their lunch. But I noticed there was nothing of that going on. Oh, didn't that look lovely? Right, must get going, darling. Can't you wait? My brother's coming in half an hour. No, darling, I've got to get to the garden centre on the way home. Ooh, it's still beautiful out here, huh? Okay, well, we get back as soon as you can. You've got to do the bathroom, right? I do. Bye, darling. About an hour and a half later, back at Free and Barnet, a neighbour thought Lee had a visitor. I saw this black car driving with a black man driving it. Um, it struck me as being a bit odd because it didn't look like a minicab to me because it was too lovely a car. I saw her car was there, so I thought, well, it's not for Lee, but he stopped in front of her window and gave a nod and then quickly drove out. Police need to eliminate this driver. The car had a distinctive V-shaped aerial. Hello? Lee, it's me. How's things? Oh, great! I got some gorgeous flowers from the garden centre. Listen, babes, I'm just getting ready to go out, so what time does this do start? Around 7.30. Ha! Ah, don't you mean 8 to 8.30? Just get here as soon as you can. About the same time, the witness in Epping Forest returned home from her shopping. When I came back and I turned into my road, I saw the two men still there, and that made me a little suspicious. And um, when I went home, I mentioned to my husband that uh, it was odd to see two people standing there for five hours. About an hour later, a neighbour saw Lee drive out. She was away for half an hour, but police don't know where she went. How's it going, Kerry? God, I knew she'd be late. Where the hell is she? Lee, what are you doing? The party started. When are you going to leave? People have already arrived. Are you all right? You sound like you've been sleeping. I'm all right. I've got something to tell you, baby. I can't tell you now. I'll tell you when I get there. All right, baby. What is it? Good or bad? At least tell me that. It's good. Well, hurry up and come. This is Bielek making one for the Czechs, fouled by Marchena. I was watching the World Cup on the television when I hear a yell. I turn the volume down and I hear a loud argument going on next door and a man is shouting at Lee. I uh, became concerned, so I went outside to where my car was and uh, I looked into Lee's kitchen window. I could see the light on, but I couldn't see or hear anything. I came back in and the next thing I heard was the door bang. I went to my kitchen window and um, I saw Lee getting into her car unaided on the passenger side, while at the same time a man got into the driving position. I caught a glimpse of him and uh, 
I think he had the fairy's hair. Next morning, Lee's convertible was seen in Epping Forest, near where the two suspicious cars had been noticed the previous afternoon. Then, at lunchtime, a rambler peered inside the GTI and saw a body. Lee had three wounds in her head, perhaps made by bolts fired from a crossbow. Doug Harvey, why are you convinced this was a, a calculated, a planned killing? Apart from a general feeling of the whole job, the fact she was lured from her house to a very isolated spot in the forest, and probably more important, the weapon. A powerful crossbow is hardly the sort of weapon you might just happen to have with you. So you'd really like to hear from anybody who knows any East London or Essex villain who's been toying around with a crossbow apart from anything else. It's such an unusual weapon that that sort of information might be vital, yes. Now, also, you need to know anybody who knew Lee, or knew her as Debbie, perhaps, anyone at all. Yeah, this is an execution by any other name, and uh, I'm not happy yet that I've found a motive that would fit such a grave crime, so I would urge anyone who hasn't yet contacted us to come forward, please. Yeah, we've got some home video, which uh, shows Lee at a party, um, dressed as a... There, there she is there, you'll see that she's dressed as a belly dancer here as well. There she is. If you knew her, please give us a, give us a call. Now... The next thing we need to know are those, uh, perhaps to eliminate, those two guys seen in the two cars uh, by the witness in Epping Forest. They might have been nothing to do with this killing, of course. No, quite right. But uh, I do need to see them or find someone who else who saw them. Um, the white man with the red car, all I can tell you about him, unfortunately, is he was wearing black tracksuit trousers with a red stripe down the seam. The driver of the, uh, the, white, the green car, a black man, he's about mid-30s, six foot, Slim build, he's got a moustache, neatly cut hair, probably gelled back, light brown skin, and he was wearing a, a long-sleeved yellow sweatshirt. OK, this is Saturday the 23rd of June, and they were there, we think, from about half past one and, until about half past six, maybe even later. At least six o'clock, maybe even later. OK, fine. Well, if that was you, please give us a call. If you know who it was or know anything about this, here's the number. Please notice it's a new one, and incidentally not the number in Radio Times, 081-811-8181. And here's a number for deaf viewers who have a Minicom Supertel phone. And if you prefer, you can ring the incident room in Edmonton. That's on 081 807 9332. That's 081 807 9332. Our first case is one that's already made national headlines. The murder of Anne Heron on the hottest day of the year. It was a Friday afternoon, Friday, August the 3rd, and temperatures almost touched 100 Fahrenheit, which means you might remember it. Where were you? The crime was committed in County Durham, though, as you'll see, the killer could have come from anywhere in Britain. This is the market town of Darlington, and even early that Friday morning, the heat was becoming quite oppressive. At some time after 10, Anne Heron went shopping in the town with her friend Dawn Perry. I've known Anne for two years now and became very good friends. She was a very loving person. You know, she would do anything for anybody. You know, she had a heart of gold. She was just... She was just a girl in a million. We were going to a party on the 3rd of August and she was really looking forward to having a good night out with all the girls, you know, a real good get-together. Anne's home, Aeolian House, is a conspicuous building a mile from Darlington on the A67 towards Middleton St George. Anne was a Glaswegian who'd moved down here to County Durham when she met her husband ten years ago. She loved the place, but she was frightened of its isolation and was wary of being alone in the house. Her friends say she was happy and bubbly with those she knew, but they describe her as rather private and a modest woman. What a scorcher today, a wonderful Costa del sunny Friday afternoon in Cleveland, North Yorkshire and South Durham. 95, 95. 
Her husband, Peter, whose office is just down the road, always came home for lunch. Hello, Princess. How are you? I'm OK. It wasn't so hot. Aye. Resist being sent home for yesterday's strike. Britain's hottest day, the temperature heads for 98 degrees. Renewed fighting has broken out in Kuwait as Iraqi Ah, oh, great, great. Yesterday, eight American oil workers are reported... You're not having anything? No, I had something at McDonald's while I was out shopping. This morning, Did you buy anything? Hotel, Just a birthday present for Diane. And what are you doing this afternoon? I thought I might do a couple of hours sunbathing. Didn't get a chance this morning. At two o'clock, Peter went back to work. We're off to an exhibition of old and rare musical instruments shortly. Some to Judy Zook and a new version of an old song. I've been trying to get hold of you all week. Listen, I can't give you a lift to the party tonight. I'm really sorry. But the car's full up and I've no spare seats. A friend, Sheila Eagle, is the last person known to have spoken oh, to Anne. Really it's now 2.30. Don't worry, it's all right. Oh, OK. What are you up to this afternoon? I was going to sit in the garden and top up my tan. Oh, you'll end up looking like a wizened old prune. Oh, <laughs> you're just jealous. See you tonight, Anne. Bye. Just before 3.30, Margaret Shaw saw Anne sunbathing close to the house. This is the last known sighting of Anne. At about a quarter to five, a blue car, possibly an Astra, was seen outside Anne's house. And later, it's thought there was a blue Sherpa van parked at the end of the drive with three men in it. Just after five, a taxi passed the house and the passenger saw someone running down the road. She thought it odd that a man was running so fast and despite the heat, was in long trousers. He ran off towards Middleton St George. At about the same time, a taxi driver noticed a car speeding down the drive away from the house. He wasn't sure if it was going to stop. He came out behind me and accelerated very, very fast, passed me straight. And as he passed me, I, I, I looked over and got a, a split-second glimpse of him, and he accelerated past over the roundabout, heading towards Darling. Just before 6 p.m., Peter Heron came home. Unusually, Anne was not there to meet him, and the front door was wide open. He found Anne's body in the living room. Her throat had been cut with something like a Stanley knife. Mr. Edmund, was it someone she knew? Do you know? It's quite probable that she did know her killer, yes. There were no signs of a struggle either inside the house or outside of the house. So presumably you need to know everyone who, who knew Anne, anyone at all? We certainly do. We need to know anyone who we haven't contacted already who knew Anne. There are clearly a lot of people we saw from that film that need to be eliminated. The jogger, for example, probably nothing to do with the crime, but could be a critical witness. That's correct. He could be absolutely vital to us. He's probably a local man who was passing the house at about the right time and for some reason hasn't come forward. I would certainly appeal to him to come forward and speak to us, even at this late stage. And then that car, so many people saw the car, one car speeding, one car parked outside a house, possibly the same, same one, even though seen by lots of different people. That's probably right. We do think it is, in fact, the same car that was parked at the house and came down the drive, and it's vital that we, in fact, trace the owner of that vehicle. That's obviously the most interesting of, of the sightings coming so fast out of the house, and it's probable, again, that the van that was parked at the end is something you need to eliminate, isn't it? That's, that's correct, yes. The three men who were with that van parked at the end of the drive 
are essential witnesses and we would urge them there aren't many vehicles with such a sign as that on the side it's a trident logo horse I mean, we, we think that that's it from people's recollection it's that's something like that yes and of course a lot of other people will have been going on this road it's a, it's a main road isn't it out of darlington to, to teesside airport that's right the a67 is the main route from darlington to teesside airport and it's a very busy road we need to speak to anyone who used that road that Friday afternoon. They could be essential witnesses. They may have seen something that we haven't found out yet. OK, well, if you think you were driving then, the date is the 3rd of August, Friday the 3rd. Check your diary if you've got one. And if you can help in any way, or if you knew Anne, here's the number, 081 811 -8181. Or you can call the incident room at Durham Police Headquarters. That's 091-386-4929. 091-386-4929. Our first case tonight is a 33-year-old man from Hounslow in Middlesex who was found murdered two months ago. On the night he died, Wednesday the 22nd of August, Paul Stevens did much as he did most evenings. He dropped into a couple of local pubs and chatted to acquaintances and some fellow customers. Some of the people who saw Paul that night have taken part in our film in the hope of finding his killer. His only real friend was Sylvie Robinson, who was a kind of mother figure to him. I met Paul in the local pub in Felton, two weeks after me arriving from Bournemouth. A very nice gentleman to meet. Knew my son, he said. Um, just got talking about everything general, saying that he was gay, and I got on very well with him. He had nowhere to stay as far as I was concerned. So I said he could come round and visit me if he was really stuck. And from then on, I got to know Paul quite well. It seemed as though no one seemed to get on well with him. A very lonely man, but I always got on all right. Paul, Paul, it's half past 10. Come on, time to get up, shape up. Are you awake? I'm awake. I'm going to sleep with you. Oh, Come that on, noise. Come on, shape up. I'm awake. I don't know. I feel rough, too. So. You shouldn't stay out, should you? I'm going to put the kettle on make some tea. Stop shouting. Well, come on, then. I'll make the tea if you give us a minute, all right? Come on, then. Well, give us a minute. Just a minute. Paul treated me more or less like a mother, more than anything else. Tea's up, Sylph. Bye. Uh, he was a gentleman in gentlemanly manner. I'll grab my tea and then I'm going to go straight out. He um, trapped me well, always go. used to take me out and buy things for me and drinks and just take me everywhere he wanted to go. I'm going for this job. Oh, yes. I told you oh, yeah. Where's, where's it to? Where's, well, I don't going? know where it is yet. He hasn't said. It's bar oh. work. Oh, it is bar work. Been a barman again. Yeah. I think you'd be all right with this job, then? Yeah, if it works out. Because you've been waiting long enough, haven't you? Yeah, I know. I think you'd be all right, now. Get a start somewhere. Paul did enjoy bar work because he was meeting people all the time and it was good for Paul. He never really slept on his job at all. He really had no, no uh, family to care about him. So he used to just stay here, thinking he was more in, at home here you, than dinner. in his own brother's place. Come on, then. Come on. There we go. Come on. Hey, my friend, don't you? My little friend. Never seemed to be able to mix with people very well. And he looked to me as though as, um, he was just a lonely person. On the Wednesday morning, Paul left the flat at 10.30 to go and see somebody about getting a job. He said he would see me later. A friend of mine from Bournemouth arrived, Michael Reed. We went to the chariot and Paul was in the chariot in Amazon. Mike! Yeah, I'm all right. What's the job doing? Well, he hasn't turned up yet, has he? Still waiting? Oh, no, dear. He should. He said he was going to meet me here, but he hasn't been here. No? Yes, do you want to drink, Zoe? Yes, please. Ten extra, please. Uh, part of half a ten extra, please. 
Not going to buy me one then? Oh, yeah, Paul, they got a pint, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like How's it going then with the job then? Ah, something will turn up. I mean, if this doesn't happen, maybe something else will, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. me, I'll work. Anyway, look, I've got to get going, because I don't want to miss him just in case he does turn up. Right, I'll see you around. Yeah, much. OK, Paul, all best, mate. Can you leave the door and the latch for me, love? It's not like you, Paul. I Please. thought it was very strange yeah. that yeah, Paul well, should ask well. me to leave the door, because he always used to knock no matter what hours of the night or morning, early hours of the morning, he was still... I would still let him in anyway. I came into the bar. It's about quarter to seven as usual to start work. Paul was waiting at the bar to be served with a pint of Carlsberg. I served him his drink, had a quick hello, how are you with him? He seemed fine, quite happy. I didn't hold a full conversation with him. It was later on the same evening that I realised he'd been joined by three gentlemen. In particular, he was holding a conversation with one of these three. Uh, as the evening went on, this particular gentleman bought him drinks uh, once or twice. Uh, it seems to be having a good conversation with him, getting on with him quite well. That was about it. I don't know whether they left together. Um, but they had left the pub before the last spell had gone. It's anything else, you know, you do lots of things, you drink, you smoke, you know. It was the night of my 18th birthday and I just got some presents from my friend and um, I wanted to go and show John downstairs in the lower bar and we were interrupted by Paul who was sitting on a stool next to us and um, then uh, we were inter interrupted again by someone who he introduced as his brother and after that I felt a bit uncomfortable and said that I'd go and speak to my other friends and that I'd probably see him later. Yeah, well, I do well keep you a few friends on your game. Um, go on. <laughs> thanks yeah, a lot. I'll keep you all night, do Bye. I? Yeah, see you around. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, hey, Paul, can I help you, mate? Two pints of lager, please. John the barman is the last person known to have seen Paul Stevens alive. He served him the two pints at about 10 o'clock, which he remembers particularly because Paul normally drank half pints. John didn't see who the second pint was for. No one knows exactly what Paul did after that or whether he was alone. It is known that he somehow got to South Hall three miles away. He may have taken a bus there, he may have walked, he may have taken a cab or been given a lift by someone. Anyone who saw Paul on the night of Wednesday the 22nd of August or in the small hours of Thursday the 23rd could perhaps provide the vital clue to leading police to find whoever killed him. I left my house around about half past five. I was already late for work, so I thought to myself, instead of stopping and getting a newspaper like I normally do, I'd take the canal route to get to work early. So as I was coming through the canal, I was cycling like I was normally would. I come up, I come up to where a bridge was, and I see a, what looked like a great big patch of red blotches. I thought nothing of it first. But then I got off my bike and I had a look. And when I had a look, it looked like blood. So then when I looked a bit further, I found some more. Then I looked into the water and I found a, what appeared to be a body. So from that point, I didn't know what to do, to be quite honest. I just took another glance. I got back on my bike. And I rode off down the road. I just thought to myself, you know, it couldn't happen to me. You know, I couldn't find something like that. It was dreadful. Well, the young man then went to the police and reported what he'd seen. DCI Jim Bland is in charge of the inquiry. 
So Paul Steams was a man with many acquaintances, but few friends, if any. Yes, that's right, sir. He's been described... I mean, the way the actor portrayed him there was excellent. He's been described as being very effeminate in his manners and speech. And that's the way I think he came across there. Right, now let's look first at the men we know Paul met that evening. First of all, did he eventually meet up with a man who he thought was going to offer him a job? He did meet that man, but that man actually had merely made that offer to him to, to wind him up. Um, he had no intention of giving him a job at all and told him that night that there was no job at all. Right. Now secondly, the descriptions we have of the two men he met. First of all, there was the man in the group of three that he was chatting to in the Tankerville pub. That's right. Uh, he's the one that we see buying the drinks over the counter. He's a bit That's older than Paul. He's 38 to 40. He's about 5 foot 9. He's white, as you can see. He's a medium build. And his hair, although it doesn't come across there very well, is, is described as being short, receding and dark. Um, he's got very piercing blue hazel eyes and he, has his, he was unshaven as you can see there. Right. Um, and secondly we have a video fit of the man he met later on in the evening, the man in the chariot pub, who he introduced to somebody as his brother. Yes, that's not an unusual trait in Paul. He used to introduce all sorts of people as his brother. He's younger than Paul, 19 to 21. He's about six foot tall, slim build, fair blonde hair as shown there, swept back. He's got the white T-shirt, jeans and black Adidas trainers on. Could that have been the man he bought the pint for? It was only about an hour later, if that. That's right. There's a possibility that we can't discount, but we haven't been able to find this person. And your main mystery, of course, is where Paul went after 10 o'clock, after he'd left the chariot that night. Yes, our missing eight hours. From the time he left, 10 o'clock or thereabouts, until he was found at 6, we have no idea where he went, who he was with or what he was doing. And we appeal to anyone who saw him then, to come forward and let us know. That was Wednesday the 22nd of August or the small hours of Thursday the 23rd third of August. Now, Paul rarely went to the Southall area as far as we know. He lived three miles away from there but there was a sighting of him apparently on near the spot where his body was found about three weeks beforehand. Yes, during the course of our inquiry we found one witness who says he saw Paul sat in the garden of a pub down by the canal about three weeks before he was, his body was found and we'd like to know if anybody else saw Paul in or around Southall prior to his death. When his body was found, there was £20 in his pocket, so robbery wasn't the motive. Do you have any indications what his motive might be? Well, we know that Paul had sexual contact with a man or men the night before he died. Um, we obviously would like to speak to anyone who did have any form of sexual contact with Paul, and I would ask for them to come forward. I can appreciate that gay people will not be happy about contacting the police and admitting to any sort of contact with Paul. But I can give you a, a categoric reassurance now that we have no interest other than to solve this murder. We don't intend to prosecute for people for any offences we discover along the way. Our sole interest is in solving the murder. Mr Bland, thank you very much indeed. If you can offer any information on this, please ring. We incidentally also have a voluntary worker here acting on behalf of the gay community. There are BBC researchers here too who you can ask to speak to if you prefer. Here's the number direct to the studio, 081 811 8181. Or you can ring Jim Bland's colleagues at the incident room. The number there is 071 937 0299. That's 071 937 0299. Our last reconstruction is the sad case of 23-year-old Gail Whitehouse. Eight weeks ago, on Thursday the 6th of September, she was found murdered. For five years, she'd been a familiar figure in the red light district of Wolverhampton, and she was last seen in that area on the evening of Monday the 3rd of September in Steelhouse Lane, which is where our film begins. By Thursday, three days after Gail's disappearance, Friends of hers who worked on Steelhouse Lane decided to print and distribute their own missing person leaflets. On the day she went missing, Monday the 3rd of September, Gail had started work at about half past six after leaving her two young children with the babysitter. She usually stood on the corner of Steelhouse Lane. Hi, Carol. How are you? Oh, how are you? Not too bad. It's a kid time. Drive me mad. Oh, no, I oh, know. 
the vice squad regularly patrol the Steelhouse Lane area. Our job mainly is to uh, arrest uh, the girls for loitering, for prostitution. These mainly stem from uh, complaints that we get from residents in the area because as uh, you can appreciate, some of the vice area is a residential area. I've known Gail Whitehouse for about five years. Gail was very, very friendly. She was a nice girl, probably one of the nicer girls. We had no problems with her at all. No. You're going to take me in then? We uh, do arrest the girls every night. They are fined uh, approximately £150 per time, and that's if they're arrested every week and, you know, can soon mount up. At about half past eight, Gail was seen getting into a car with two men. Right. She was back again within about half an hour. At about 20 past nine, a local security guard saw Gail. I popped into the grocery shop uh, for a pack of the cigarettes and I noticed the young girl that I know now as Gail Whitehouse standing on the corner talking to a, an Asian chap. When I was coming out with my cigarettes, I noticed she was walking across the road onto the hospital car park. There was a gold-coloured cortina on the hospital car park with an Asian chap sitting on the bonnet. Gail and the other one walked towards the car. Uh, they spoke. The one on the bonnet got off and they all got into the car and I just carried on with my normal round. See you, Gail. Then just before 10 o'clock, Gail's friend Diane was picked up by a client, leaving Gail alone on Steelhouse Lane. Then just after 10, two witnesses driving along Steelhouse Lane saw a girl like Gail apparently trying to get into a lorry parked round the corner on Jenner Street. And it was shortly after 10 when Diane came back to Steelhouse Lane, but Gail was nowhere to be seen. Three days later, just a hundred yards away from that corner, Gail's body was found in some undergrowth. She'd been strangled. DCI Sid Law is in charge of this case, and first of all, it's important to find the driver of that lorry. It is very important indeed. We do wish him to come forward as soon as possible. We don't know exactly what the vehicle is, whether it's a, a brand new vehicle, but it is silver or grey in colour. In fact, that whole area is popular with lorry drivers as a place to park overnight, isn't it? Yes, it is. There are several roads off Steelhouse Lane where lorry drivers do park overnight. Adelaide Street, which is adjacent to Wasteland nearby, uh, All Saints Road, which is off Steelhouse Lane, as is Eagle Street, and also Eager Tyre Services, which is in Steelhouse Lane itself. The lorry drivers use the forecourt there. So if you were parked anywhere in that area on Monday the 3rd of September, please give us a call. Two people you specifically need to trace are the men seen with the gold Ford Cortina just around 9 o'clock. Yes, at 9.20pm that gold Cortina was seen on the Royal Hospital car park. Two Asian men were seen to get in it, together with Gail. We do stress that that vehicle was returned to the red light district with Gail and she did go about her business after then. But we do wish to speak to these men as they may be able to help us. Some witnesses have come forward. There must be a lot more who would have been around that night. Yes, Steelhouse Lane is a very busy thoroughfare. And in fact, on Monday the 3rd of September, there was a speedway meeting nearby between Reading and Wolverhampton. Any persons who used uh, Steelhouse Lane that night, we would ask them to come forward as they may have seen Gail. So a lot of people could have seen her that night. You've ruled out robbery as a motive. Yes, but, but also we have found that one piece of property is missing. That is Gail's wristwatch. 
It is a Seconda wristwatch, a lady's wristwatch, but it has an unusual face. It's black in colour with Roman numerals and also bears uh, the moon and constellation in the background. A very distinctive, could lead you to the killer. Of course you need anyone who had any contact with Gail that night to contact you. Yes, we would ask anyone to come forward who had contact with Gail, including her, con uh, her clients. We would treat them with the utmost discretion. Right. You are absolutely guaranteed discretion by Mr Law and his colleagues. You could prevent the same thing happening to somebody else, so please do call. The number here to the studio once again is 081 811 8181. The number direct to Wednesfield Police Station is 0902 649000. That's 0902, the code for Wolverhampton, 649000.